we weren't really told until we got there that we were teaching high school. And I thought to myself, um, before I got there, I thought, I'm going to teach primary and it's going to be really cute. When they said, you're teaching 15, 16 year olds, I just went, what? Like, what? <laughs> Hello, Sophie, it's, it's really great to meet you. Um, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Um, so I really enjoyed your blog. Um, for people who haven't read it or are getting to know you for the first time, can you tell us how you got from studying animation at art college to exploring English teaching? Yeah, uh, it was definitely not expected to um, go from the creative sector for 10 years, which was studying art and design for 10 years into teaching English. So it was quite like a, a bit of a slow build up to go into this industry in the first place. So it's um, it wasn't really planned, but it just happened over time. I think really the want to travel, the want to do something good, um, I think it kind of just turned into that really. Great, so you talk in your blog about immediately getting offers from English teaching companies in China after you finish your degree. Um, but you say you had, you had no real interest in teaching abroad at that point or nothing concrete. So how did those offers come uh, and what were your plans at that point? So um, as soon as I finished university, I, I moved back to Cornwall from Plymouth. Um, I immediately put my CV on Indeed, I think it was, or LinkedIn oh, publicly. Yeah. And I put out my contact details, like my phone and my email, the phone is a very bad idea, but at the time, because <laughs> um, you would get a lot of scam calls going, um, hello, you've won a lottery. And I just go, no, I didn't. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the random email came to me um, saying, hey, so if we want you to uh, teach abroad and do you want to talk to us in an interview? And I thought to myself, okay, um, I'll have the interview. Let's see. We could talk things through and um, see what happens. And he's, they sent me, the company sent me videos of um, what teaching is required and how it's going to be. The first initiation, I thought, oh, no, 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 no. Because the <laughs> thought of being in a noisy classroom far away from home, I'm just like, no. It's just no. So at the time of planning, I really was determined to go into the creative sector, such as, you know, freelance illustration, um, videography, photography, graphic design, anything creative. Um, but unfortunately, it just didn't pan out that way because in Cornwall, you know, when people think of Cornwall, they think of, you know, it's a very arty place and it, it really is, but there's no careers so you know sector in that area and there isn't really a it's just not there financially and economy you have to go out of the Cornwall to do it but then people just don't know what they want in art so I didn't know what I could do to achieve that so I think really I kind of was just like okay I'll try something else for now but it didn't really pan out that way unfortunately no, I hate it. Well, I mean, it worked out for the best overall, though. Um, so you made the excellent choice to study for a 120 hours certificate with TEFL work in late 2019. What did you find challenging on the course and what advice would you give to people who fancy trying it out? Um, the, the challenges were, it was just like the, the grammar part was definitely the trickiest. Um, I think I think it, the nice thing about the course I did was there's always, it's like the fear I had was I thought to myself, I'm, I'm never going to get this right. The quiz itself about which present is which, which past is, which past is it, which future goes where. And every time you would say the, qu the quiz would say, you have to start again. I was so worried thinking I have so many limitations. I think it took me at least 10 times to get that quiz out of the way. And I really was like, I, I ended up calling the TEFL, <laughs> um, the TEFL.org line to say, I think I'm going to fail. Like I spent somebody on this, like I'm failing. And they said, you're not failing. 
if you you only fail if you don't try and honestly I had so much a limitations of just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying because the idea is it's a you're always learning there's there's no such thing as limitations you're gonna learn and I think that's what's so cool about this course is that no matter how many times you you know you you try and answer the questions even though they come out wrong and then you're gonna re- renew the quiz or assignment you're always learning and you know I think they say as I say you only fail if you stop trying and that was such a reassuring feeling um but the challenges was definitely the um believing I could uh, like self-belief really because I didn't believe I could do it but now here I am teaching yeah. abroad um and it's just lovely that I've I, I've just been giving so many chances and just didn't give up um and I think to the advice for the people who are going to try it, you, you have to remember, like I say, you don't, you don't succeed if you don't try and just, just learn from it. And you're, you're going to learn so much on this course. You're going to learn about the grammar. You're going to learn about mythology. You're going to learn about how to teach and stuff. So, you know, and there's no such thing as failing on the course. You just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. So that's advice I would give to the new applicants, really. That's that's really valuable. And I think like although, you know, the TEFL course is is for anyone to do, I think there is a challenge there because you're essentially deconstructing, especially if you speak English as your as your native language. You know, you're, you're essentially learning how to learning how to you know, how how the language you speak works. The nuts and bolts of it. So I don't think you're alone there. I think the, gra- the grammar is definitely something that uh, trips people up, but they, they do learn from it ultimately. So, mm. um, talking of teaching, yeah. you, you've, you've said to us before recording that uh, teaching is in your family, um, and you were told you had natural teaching traits. I'm interested to know what those traits were. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so, they all say the traits are you need to be patient and have a lot of knowledge. Well, the patience is the biggest trait of all, because when you're teaching um, so many levels of grades or, um, you know, challenging students, you have to be very patient. And um, it's funny because I'm more impatient with technology than people, <laughs> which is a bit weird. Yeah. So, no, um, <laughs> but they told me <laughs> um, the traits were basically like, you know, I'm, um, you know, I have empathy sympathy and um just happy to just let you know show how to do it again and again and again and again so there was one example my grandma um who I call Nina she is I hope she forgives me saying it but she's not great with technology at all and tv and she was she had a whole recording set of the bbc news i think from the pandemic and i'm just like Okay, I'll show you how to delete them. <laughs> and um, and I showed her step by step again and again. And she said to me, why aren't you a teacher right now? And I'm just like, well, I just got my TEFL course. But this was also before the pandemic. So it kind of just been building up for a, a while. But I used to be very impatient with a lot of things. But I just, I've always had this trait of being patient with people and and animals and stuff like that. So, um, and I'm, and I'm always hungry for knowledge and I'm, I love learning and I like to pass it on to anybody else. So it's kind of those traits really where you spend a lot of time going around to find work in Cornwall and then you still want, you're still learning and you're still hungry to learn things. So I think it's just been like, it's just been a slow build up to getting the teaching traits in the end. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just say uh, your your Nina isn't alone in that because uh, when I was living at home, um, I accidentally uh, recorded a series link to The Simpsons. Um, and they were like <laughs> within a week, there are like a hundred episodes or something, and I, I fill up all the memory with it. So like, so, like you can do you can do that at any age. Um, um, <laughs> So how, how influential was that teaching family background in deciding to study for a TEFL certificate? Because we've spoken to other people who um, 
they maybe initially didn't want to be teachers because they were teachers in their family and it was sort of act of rebellion of like no i'm not going to be a teacher but you sound more the other way where like you're informed and influenced by the uh, family background you have in teaching. So can you tell us about how that nudged you towards getting a TEFL certificate? I think it's like, um, because my grandma taught in Yorkshire in the 1950s and 60s until the 1990s, um, <laughs> she always went on to say, I really miss teaching because it's, it's so rewarding and it's challenging, but it pushes you to be better and it teaches you how to be a better person and, and learn about somebody else that's not in your shoes kind of thing. Um, so I, whenever I hear her tell about it, I'm just like, that sounds so lovely and it sounds amazing. On my mum's side, not so much because my mum taught college students travel and tourism and I think she enjoyed teaching, but she didn't like the age group, but she wishes that she could teach maybe like younger like geography or something um i think really just seeing that just watching them teach and how they've you know not so much my grandma because you know because like she was a teacher so you know many years ago and i'm never going to meet her former students but when it comes to my mom's side I've seen her students go and be travel, you know, work in the travel industry, like cabin crew, um, and just seeing them do so well and thanking her, my mother, for giving her the opportunity. So really, I think it's just that it's just you've done a job and, you know, with, when you, when you do art, it's like, oh yeah, it's amazing. And then they don't say thank you, really. They're just like, it's a great work. But with teachers, they thank you and they value you. And I feel like I feel like I want a taste of that, really. Um, and it, it just really, it's just been something I've been fascinated for, but I didn't believe I could do it. But until they started saying, we think you could be a good teacher, but I'm just, I just didn't believe I could do it at first. But now I believe I can because I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to take a quick break and then uh, Sophie and I will be back talking about Barcelona, uh, the challenges of uh, teaching during a pandemic and even more. Amazing. So so here there'll be like a little do 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 do. Okay. You can get one of the table course. So uh, you happy to go just straight back into it? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, so for editing purposes, I'll just do a little countdown in my head. I'm not going mental. I just I'm visualizing what it's like uh, on the screen. So <laughs> okay. So um, in your blog, you describe some of the sort of choices that you felt you had at the time and the life circumstances that you had at the time. Um, I was wondering if we could explore those and how they triggered the decision to get into TEFL. Um. Well, yeah. So. Um... After my degree, I um, went straight, straight back to Cornwall and tried to get into the creative sector. Um, it did lend, it did end up that I needed to go on the government benefits. Um, there's no shame about it because it's absolutely needed because there was no way I could like support myself a little bit, even though I was living at home. Um, I still needed it because I had, you know, student debt and other things I had to pay off as well. Um, so, so really it was, it was not a choice I wanted, but I thought, well, it's just going to be a temporary thing until I find something that's going to help me get a job or get around. Um, but it unfortunately prolonged for three years. So I went from one job to another, but they didn't, they didn't really last very long because A, it wasn't really you know, if you're built for something, like, for example, if you're built, if you can clean, you can clean. I can't clean very well. Um, if you can do tele, you know, telecom calls and stuff, um, you can do it. I can't, you know. Um, if you can do bartending, you could do bartending. I can't do it very well. Um, if you can scare children at Halloween, I can do that. But it's only temporary. Okay. So, um, 
<laughs> so before I was a teacher, I was a scare actor, which was really good fun. I used to scare children for a job for just two weeks. So that was interesting. Right. Okay. And ha- <laughs> we have to we have to explore that. I'm sorry. So what does that involve? Um, so I was working in a family park in Devon and um I got to be a witch, a scarecrow in a maze and just scare the living daylights out of kids like mostly big kids in the scarecrow maze because if they were toddler we would i would be in serious trouble so you have to have big kids and i would just be on i'd be hiding and i would jump out and they'd be like (laughs) just like (laughs) so i'm just like yes i'm doing my job right um but i was only for i was only for two weeks so it wasn't a full time if it was i think i would not be able to talk at all because i would do a lot of roar and <laughs> screaming and king kong and stuff like that but no <laughs> um, so that's, there's been... that's sensational <laughs> yeah yeah i'm amazed i don't know how it uh, yeah so <laughs> but after a while you kind of feel bad because sometimes you make kids cry and i'm just like i'm sorry i'm just doing my job <laughs> so um so there's been many levels of trying to find work and challenges but I think that was when I finally had that okay I really need to I think I'm going to enter the Tefal world because I think let's just give it a try and um, stop scaring children for a job and just do something nice (laughs) so (laughs) I know Uh, yeah of of all the routes that you know I've I've spoken to a bunch of people for this podcast now and of all the routes of getting to Tefal that has to be my favourite my (laughs) favourite I love, I love that. Um so uh yeah, um yeah, um you ended up taking a trip to Barcelona uh, before fully getting into the sort of TEFL course and studying to be a teacher. How important and how formative was that trip? Because we've spoken to other people who were really inspired by holiday and not just the sense of being somewhere else, but being somewhere else and feeling like I could make home somewhere else. Mm. Well, um so it was around, I th- I'd say early February, um, I finished my um, classroom assignment and it did not go well, unfortunately. Like, I didn't enjoy it because I was really ill with the flu um, and I was still oh. really unwell. So I couldn't really do, the, do what I wanted to do. And I was really stressed out about trying to be a good impression, trying to be a good teacher, but I just couldn't because I was so poorly. And I felt like, I can't do this. Like, if I can't engage with the adults, because um, with the whole uh, the whole idea of a classroom assignment is you're learning how to be a teacher by a tutor. But I f- was getting the wrong impression that I'm a teacher, but I'm learning how to be a teacher. So it was a bit confused. It's quite confusing to say it. But like after that, I felt like I was saying, I just don't think I could do this because um, because. I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve and I wasn't happy with it. So I guess I put the TEFL course at the back seat for at least two weeks because I really was down about the whole experience and um, a bit bugger, a, a bit burned out about it. And then my mum said to me, you, you know, why not go to Barcelona for just five days and get a taste of going abroad? And you might, you never know. It's just a little taste of what your life could be like if you went to Barcelona and so um and so I went and I had a wonderful time in Barcelona and I was saying to myself I really want to be here I want to go away I think I can do this and then as soon as I came back from Barcelona um I think a day later after <laughs> I remember the day that the, the journey back was horrendous because we had Storm Desmond, I think it was, or oh, Derry, yes, yeah. and it was 2020. And it was, it took me, I think, 24 hours to get back for what should have been a four hour trip back to Cornwall. It took about 24 hours. <laughs> so, That's um, so a day later after that, I just got up and I'm just like, I'm going to do this. Like, let's get this done. And then, um, at the it was I remember the day very well it was February the 28th and I finished the course and I was just I remember went down to get a glass of gin and tonic and just to celebrate that I did it and I was going to get my hard copy (laughs) 
So, <laughs> yeah. So you get a certificate, you enjoy your gin and tonic, um, mm-hmm. and a job pops up. Now, where did the opportunity to teach in Thailand come from? And, and what was it about that particular job or that particular experience that made you think, right, well, it's time, let's do this? Well, when I was offered to teach in China, um, I turned down China because I didn't know China as well. I mean, you can, I, I'm not going to mention about the politics side and we're not going to because it's not, that's not the whole point we're here. But I just didn't know China and China is huge, you know, it's massive. And I just don't know China. But when I went to Thailand in 2016, and I just felt totally head over heels in love with this country, I was just like, I want to go there to teach. And um, when I found out you could teach there, uh, because I didn't think you could because it's a tourist destination, but you can teach there. I was like, that's my first choice. So when I started applying, um, I started applying to two of the companies. One of them was the biggest company in Thailand for foreign teachers. And, um, and I turned it down because it was, uh, it was the first, um, it was too small. Like the place I was going to be working was too small and, um, very rural. And I wasn't sure I was ready for that one. And then I applied for the second company and the, where they were going to place me looked very good. It was close to the capital, which is Bangkok and, um, near the sea. I was just like, yes, this is for me. This is for me. And then all of a sudden lockdown. <laughs> yep. So. Yeah. Um, and then my yeah, so, dreams so were shattered. <laughs> well, you talk us through, I mean, obviously it sounds like it was a pretty kind of grim time, but it did end up with you teaching in Thailand. So, Thailand, so what was that What was that time like? I mean, were you constantly kind of waiting by the phone for news or did you get certain dates when things might get changed? Um, what, what, was the, what was the anticipation like? Um, it was... It, it was, um, very questionable, if I'm honest, because, um, I wasn't like getting the information I needed and it wasn't very clear. Like they didn't contact me. Like I had my interview on March 2020, um, before lockdown. And then they were saying, yeah, you can come out. No problem. Um, and then when lockdown happened, they kind of, ghosted not ghosted me but they just stopped talking um so really that dream started to just wither away and I just felt like I'm not going anywhere anymore so I thought to myself right we'll just sit just sit around just see what happens I mean you know remember we you know if we can remember what it was like we were thinking to ourselves it's gonna end it's gonna end very soon that ended up to six months and then to a year and then a year and a half to the point where I was going somewhere. So after waiting in anticipation and just not getting anywhere, um, I decided to just wait it out till everything just calmed down and just, um, make sure it's not too, too complicated because at the time it was very, COVID was really bad, uh, in Thailand because foreign teachers were online teaching and it just wasn't worth it just wasn't a time to go anymore so I just thought I'm just gonna wait it out a little bit longer and then um that's what happened but then I started to think I'm, I'm not gonna go anywhere so um but the wait paid off a year later <laughs> yeah so, so so talk to us about that so <clears throat> when you did eventually get to move to Thailand. What, what kind of status was the pandemic at? And, and did it impede at all? Or were there different sort of challenges in terms of moving abroad? Because, you know, it's difficult enough to uproot yourself and move to somewhere totally different, start a new job, somewhere totally different. But how did the pandemic play into that? Um, oh, let me think. I'm just trying to think. Um, it was, it was a, it was a bit more difficult. Um, when I was talking to 
uh, the teachers who've been there before the pandemic, it was very easy and everything was going smoother and stuff like that. But with the state of the pandemic in Thailand at the time, this was 2021 in October, things were starting to just slowly get back to normal. Like, I, but you were still having to wear a mask and stuff like that. And they were very, very, very careful to not give you like COVID. So it was pretty, it wasn't like harsh strict. It was just, you know, just follow the rules and you'll be fine. Um, but you have to make sure you, <laughs> I think the worst bit was, was you have to get the COVID test at the boots section and you have to pay that and then wait to like, you have to, I just got to a point where I was praying to God. I did not socialize for like two months, stayed in my room just to make sure I wasn't going to get COVID. Cause if I got COVID, I could not fly and I have to cancel the flight and book it again. So it was just a horrible feeling like, I hope it's not it. I hope it's not it. Um, and I remember going to the appointment with three layers of face masks because I was just, oh, wow. yeah. I was so determined to go because I was so excited to go. And they all came back negative and everything was fine, but it was still quite stressful because, you know, you just don't want to get COVID before your flight, basically. Um, but, uh, but now things are back to normal in Thailand. Like they go straight, they don't have to quarantine anymore. They don't have to do the sandbox scheme. So, but when I went, um, we had to quarantine in Phuket. So it was like called a sandbox scheme. And, you know, you could enjoy a holiday, but you still had to follow the rules and wear a mask at 100 degrees. <laughs> so it was quite difficult. So it was quite challenging. It was quite challenging. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're just taking a quick break and we'll be right back with Sophie who tells us what it's like teaching in Thailand and where she ended up next. Feeling inspired? Fancy trying something completely new? We'll make your best move yet by signing up for a TEFL course with the most highly accredited provider on the planet. Here at the TEFL Org, we offer a range of online and classroom courses that you can study at your own pace. All of our courses include top of the range teaching materials and come with dedicated tutor support from experienced and highly qualified TEFL experts. And what's more, we'll give you money off to do it. Just enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off any of our internationally recognized TEFL courses. And that includes our best selling 120 hour premier online course. With that code, you'll not only get 50% off, but you'll also get a free lesson plans pack. Within a matter of months, you could be a qualified TEFL teacher out there exploring the world or working to your own schedule from home as an online English teacher. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout to get started. So when you did get to teaching in Thailand, it was to teenagers, right? Specifically 14, 16 year olds. 15, 16. Ask, 15, 16, right. So I have to ask, how daunting was that as a first teaching job? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the agency I was with, they didn't, um, they all taught high school. So there was no okay. kindergarten, there was no primary. So we were all we weren't really told until we got there that we were teaching high school. And I thought to myself, um, before I got there, I thought, I'm going to teach primary and it's going to be really cute. When I said, you're teaching 15, 16 year olds, I just went, what? Like, what? <laughs> what? And they were like, yes, you're going to be fine. I'm just like, okay. I hope I, if, if not, I'm running out of here. Um, so. <laughs> So it was so daunting. Don't be there, don't be there. It was very daunting. Um, but, uh, but the, the nice thing of all is that the, the teachers are so nice and very inclusive and they reassure you that it's going to be fine. Um, but I just remember, uh, it was my first day, the night before it was the first day I couldn't sleep. I was just like, I'm teaching 16 year olds, I'm teaching 16 year olds, I'm going to be all right, I'm going to be all right. Um, and then that, and the day came and I'm just like, um okay but the worst thing of all was we were teaching online 
and teenagers mm. online teaching don't mix very well because they don't talk no. and they don't want to because they're on their phones or playing games i'll be like um i'll be calling out for example a uh, piano um can you say hello piano and nothing so the first few weeks were really, the first few days was, was really hard, really, really hard. But then over time, the students start to feel more like, okay, you're not like, they don't see me as a strict and difficult teacher. I'm, I'm new to it. So I'm just like, look, I'm new. You, and this is all a bit new for us. So let's see what we can do. Um, so really over the, and then over time, it just started to get a bit more, um, better and the students start to warm up to me and and stuff like that and just play games online <laughs> most of the time um so unfortunately the first semester i was teaching in we were online i'd say 98 percent of the time and teaching in person maybe two percent of the of the first five months so that was quite um disappointing but um and until i talk about the next semester, which is even better. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, let's get on to that second semester. So over time, you know, the students warmed to you. How did they respond to you when it was more in person? And and I have to ask, like, were they asking you questions about, like, English, specifically Cornish culture? I don't know how you feel about Cornish independence, but, you know, I'll make it distinct. Um, and did they try to get you into stuff that was popular in Thailand at the time? Um, if I'm honest, um, they didn't really care about my Cornish culture because I think I think no. really because um, they're very more influenced in American culture. Um, when okay. they think of British, they think of um, the Queen or the royal family and Harry Potter. Um, so they think of that. They don't see they don't see England like they don't see they don't see England like you know there's Somerset, Cornwall, and all these little places. All they see is London and harry potter and i'm just like right okay so i'm gonna have to be can't talk about my cornish heritage or such because i don't think they don't quite understand that quite yet so you have to be i guess just roll with it until student will start to ask you those things but they didn't they would just ask me teacher how do i pronounce this word for example this student couldn't say the word nervous because he was very nervous to speak english when he started mm -hmm. so i said to him nervous and he goes nervous and i said nervous because they can't say r or pronounce it very well so mm -hmm. really they asked me how to pronounce english words better instead of asking about english culture um but they taught me about thai culture and um what they like and what don't they like and stuff like that um, and they told me, uh, one of them said to me, teacher, whatever you do, don't talk about our king. And I'm just like, oh, the Thai king. And they said, yes. <laughs> so I'm just like, Lively okay. Lively Lively <laughs> I was like, okay, I won't. And they go, thank you. <laughs> well, I give advice so, for anyone uh, teaching in Thailand anytime soon. Um, um, so yes, yes. Strong advice about that. Yeah. Um, so what kind of challenges day-to-day did, um, -day did you face like in a classroom? Um, you, you said before, I think you mentioned on your blog that there were sort of ups and downs. So um, specifically going to that in-classroom setting, could you talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about like the climate and the mosquitoes everywhere and spiders everywhere, but you can't change that because that's Thailand. You can't change the weather. You can't get rid of mosquitoes as much as we want to, as much as I wanted to, um, but you can't. <laughs> I think the challenges of teaching in Thailand is when you teach in person, there's, you know, I think the biggest class I've ever had was 41 students. 15 or 16 year olds wow. you know it's a it's massive and you have this you have to check every single student is speaking the worst thing of all it's like it's the phones and no matter what you do or say they will not get off their phones and you're trying your hardest to teach them 
but they will not get off their phones. And I told them, guys, classroom rules are no phones in my class. They have their phones out <laughs> all the time. So that's really hard. Um, and you can't discipline them because um, it's a language barrier and there's no consequences, unfortunately. So there is a downside of teaching in Thailand is lack of consequences if there's badly behaved students. Um, classroom control can be challenging, especially on the phones, because they use their phones for translation, like writing or speaking to teacher. Um, so that's challenging and managing a big classroom. Um, so really, those were the biggest challenges, I would say. And um, I think when it comes to the exams, that's even harder because they cheat. Um, so you have to keep on top of that. But the nice thing about Thailand is that, you know, they don't they don't get angry with you, but they will get angry if you didn't prepare it properly. But like, it's it's quite tricky. It's uh, it's quite a challenge. Um to maintain that they don't cheat or uh, they don't cross the line and stuff like that. But um, th there are lots of challenges of teaching in Thailand. But, uh, but at the same time, you have, a, you have to have a good time. Um, try not to be too strict about it or too stressed about it because it's, it doesn't make the experience enjoyable for you and for the student as well because you are a guest to their country. And the last thing you want to do is show that you're scary and stuff which is not the case so it's quite challenging <laughs> so, so when there were like those kind of better moments and breakthrough moments um did it feel like more victory when you were able to sort of reach students because it was difficult in terms of them being on their phones and a language barrier and stuff like that did, in this kind of scenario do like the frustrating moments make the better moments even better, even better? It, it does i mean um it, it teaches a teacher as well. What could you do to improve? What could you do to improve your lessons? Or, um, how can you make a lesson effective? How can you make your content more interesting for the student? Um, and then that's when I started to think, okay, I need to just change the content or have there's some levels. Cause it turns out when they're on their phones, the students are bored. So it turns out if I make it challenging and into their level, then they start more engaging. So to, it was towards the end, they stopped playing on their phones. So I think if you can recognize that your content is not suitable for them, they're not going to learn. They're just going to want to play and not listen to you. So it wasn't until I decided to change up everything and improve my teaching and my lessons that's when it started to get a bit better so probably the answer for that and it is it, strong advice for new teachers too yeah um i was about to ask actually what you would advise teachers you know what your main takeaway was from teaching in thailand um especially for those who, who want to start their TEFL adventure in, in thailand would that be your main takeaway in mm. terms of just like making the material challenging enough for students to engage with it, or was there anything else as well that you'd, you'd impart? I think I think for the first few weeks, you need to be you need to make it easy for yourself. If if you're a new teacher and you're nervous, because when I started, I was a very nervous teacher. It was my first teaching job, let alone moving abroad and and stuff like that. Um, I was just like, I'm just gonna accept. I'm gonna make mistakes, but I'm gonna learn from it. And I think also just keep it easy and simple for yourself and for the students and then build it up and see what characteristics there are. Um, so the nice thing about Thailand is that they are so laid back, too laid back sometimes, but they are, um, it's just a nice way to, it's a very friendly and lovely environment to teach in Thailand if you're a first time teacher. and. Um, you know, it's, there are challenges, of course, but I think you have to accept that you're not going to be perfect the first few weeks. You're going to make mistakes, but it, you know, you're going to learn on the job. It's like what everyone says. You're always going to learn on the job. Um, and I think really just the first few lessons, just make it 
fun and easy and then maybe take it up to a level when you're ready i think that's what i did as well you make it just put up to a bit of a level as i was building along with uh, the contract so that's all i can say i guess great uh and we'll, we'll be back to finish off the interview with sophie who tells us about her experiences in vietnam Are you looking for a weekly guide to what's going on in the TEFL world? Do you want some advice on everything from job interviews to underrated TEFL destinations? Well, the TEFL Org blog has it all. Every single week, we tackle some of the biggest questions in the TEFL industry. Stay up to date with the latest trends in English teaching, find tips to make your next job application your best yet, or get inspired and read about the experiences of TEFL Org graduates teaching all around the world. Whether you're brand new to the industry or you've seen it all, we can guarantee an interesting read each week. To find out more, go to tefl.org forward slash blog. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G forward slash blog. So uh, we're back with Sophie Oliver. Um, now, you've since moved on to Vietnam. Um, what was the inspiration behind that choice? And whereabouts in Vietnam are you? Could you describe it to us? Yeah, I, let me tell you, moving from Thailand to Vietnam was, was not an easy decision because I, I loved Thailand so much. Um, but I, there's so much to see. Um, so it was kind of to the point where I was like, let's see what Vietnam's, cause Vietnam has, now I've done Thailand and I got the craft of teaching. Let's see if I could take it up a notch. Um, and I could have moved to a different province in Thailand, like the big city like Chiang Mai or Bangkok. Um, but I remember talking to my teacher who spoke amazing English and he said, go to Vietnam um, and compare it. And I was just like, okay, it's a bit risky, but let's, let's try. Um, so now I've been in Vietnam currently for two weeks now. And I am located in Hanoi, which is a big jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a huge jump. So um, the students that you're going to be teaching, um, uh, because at the moment it's the Tet holiday? Yes, it's, uh, so, Tet, so Tet is it's like a Chinese New Year, but it's Vietnamese. So um, we're celebrating, so Chinese New Year is celebrating rabbit, in Vietnam, they're celebrating cat, so it's very oh, different. Excellent choice, right now. Excellent choice. <laughs> um, I actually had to, um, I had to, I had to, I had to shoo a cat out of this room to record this podcast. So that that seems like it was premeditated. Um, but obviously, you, you just moved and you're just getting started there. Um, and this time, you're going to be teaching with five to eleven year olds. So it's actually it's good that we've got you on the podcast at this point because we can talk about. How that's going to be as opposed to your early experiences. Um, mm. So, what major changes do you expect to make in terms of your approach as a teacher going from teaching sort of mid teenagers to five to 11 year olds? Yeah, I mean, I've always, I've always wanted to give teaching primary a try because um, I was talking to my mom about it and she said, um, You're going to enjoy teaching this age group because they're like sponges and everyone, all the teachers who I've spoke to, always say the same thing children are like sponges they're gonna soak up and they're gonna be more enthusiastic to learn um so because with teenagers they're either like "Mm, really you know but whereas kids it's different because um they are so keen to learn and in vietnam they're more keen to learn and thai students are to learn english um because um I'm not sure what it is, but I think with Thailand, because they have the influence of American and Thailand is a tourist destination. So they have more opportunity to learn English than I think in the education. Um, but with Vietnam, they, they're always looking for teachers to teach English. Um, but comparing my teaching is a big change because, um, there's more games with teaching teenagers. There, there was games, but. It was more about conversation development and 
pronunciation and get them to practice. With kids, it's all about games, vocab and games. Um, so it's a, it's a big jump from teenagers to um, children. So, yeah. No, definitely, yeah. Um, so I know you've only been there two weeks, so uh, it's a bit of a cheeky question, but what are your kind of immediate impressions? What strikes you most about Vietnam compared to your experiences in Thailand? Um, so many, so many. I mean, they say Vietnam and Thailand are very similar, but if I'm honest, they're very different. Um, the language is obviously very different. Um, the food is, is more tasty. Thai food is very spicy. Um, the weather is more diverse because in Thailand, it's got three seasons. They have hot, hotter, volcano. In Vietnam, <laughs> in Vietnam, they have all the four seasons that we have, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. So it's a variety, which is cool. Um, but I taught in Thailand in a tiny little town in Northwest Thailand where it was very small and, you know, very little. Um, whereas in Hanoi, it's a city and it's busy and what I've also noticed is that um, I, I always remind myself when it comes to going to a capital city like London or anywhere, people just don't have time to be friendly or smile and stuff like that. In Thailand, they always smile. They're always happy to see you. But um, over here, they're not so keen to stop and say hello or smile. They just go, hello, and then go on, do their thing, really. So it's a it's a very big culture shock. So it's a bit of a culture shock. Um, so just to bring this off, and it, yours is a really fascinating story because, you know, we talk about, you know, you feel like you're, you're limited, you're, you know, you're living in Cornwall, you're doing your degree and everything feels like your world feels quite small from, from what you're telling me. And then, and now you're in your second foreign country and it's just, it sounds like, an, like a really fantastic few years for you, even with all the you know pandemic and, and everything you've still managed to achieve so much it's just such a cool story um so i think you're perfect to answer this question um for people who are wondering whether tefl's right for them especially when they're not sure what path into head in generally just feeling a bit a bit a, not necessarily lost but just lacking direction a wee bit what would you say to them i think the motivation is are you bored of your situation are you fed up of going around in circles? Are you fed up of the same scenery and the same routine again and again? And you want a bit of taste of adventure or um, a, a new career? You should definitely give this a try because, you know, um, I had three options before TFL. One was to stay on benefits, go around in circles and living at home with my mom till I was 30. Don't want to do that. Option two, find a man, settle down, have children, get married, get a house, all that lovely stuff. I'm not ready for that because it's very alien to me. I'm, I'm not built that way. Or option three, get out of the comfort zone, travel, um, teach abroad, go out and make an adventure. And I chose option three. You know, I think really just write down the options of life. And that really helped me get into this direction because those options I've, I've written down. It was just a, an epiphany of realizing I can't go on the way I've been doing for years and years. I don't want to go in this direction, but if I take this direction, which is Tefel, it's gonna, it's gonna change your life for the better. Or maybe it's just an experience. You know, if it doesn't work out, it's fine. You know, but at least you've tried it. Um, so that's that's the advice I would say. Just write down the options. Which option do you want the most? And write down the pros and cons about it, and then go from there. That's all I could say, really. Brilliant. So just to finish off, um, and I should say, uh, you know, before we end our conversation, that I've been to Cornwall and really liked it, but I, I get it, like. Uh, you know, originally from a small place myself, and and sometimes you know moving is is a making of you. Um, so 
we always ask our guests this um, and we get some fascinating answers, so no pressure. Um, what piece of advice do you wish you'd been given before you started? And what piece of advice for teaching abroad would you give to anyone considering TEFL? Oh, well, that's a, <laughs> this is a question. Stubborn, I, yeah. It's quite a good, that's quite a hard, that's quite a good question. Before I started TEFL, advice I would give, I would tell her, just try, you know, write down those three options. That's what I would say. Um, and any advice for people who are moving abroad? I, what do you want out of this? Do you want financial security? Do you want experience? Do you want adventure? What do you want out of it? You know, um, if you want the financial side of things, research that country. If you want adventure, research that place. If you want to experience teaching, research that place. Always, it's just, it's just one word. It's just research because, you know, with Thailand, I didn't go there for the financial security because it doesn't really have that. But like, I went there to see, do I want to teach in abroad? Do I like teaching abroad and that stuff? And I think really just go for somewhere that you, you know, that you're going to enjoy. Cause you know, moving abroad is a huge, huge thing. Um, even if it's short term, long term, you know, you're going to experience something. And, and I would always say just it's, 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 it's perfectly okay if it doesn't work out, but at least you've done the experience. But if you are going to go on ahead, that's great. So, yeah. Well, Sophie, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Um, I can't wait to hear about the rest of your career, about your time in Vietnam and, and wherever else you end up. But um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed doing this for you guys. And I'm really excited to uh, see future TFL teachers to become teachers and then their travels. So I'm excited. Brilliant. Well, thank you. You've been listening to I Taught English Abroad, a podcast series by the TEFL Org. To keep up to date with every episode, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your streaming platform of choice. And we love feedback, so feel free to leave us a review on any platform you like. For more information about the TEFL Org or about teaching English as a foreign language in general, head on over to tefl.org. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.